Okay. Hi, okay. okay. I'm Jim Kahn. I'm uh, at the Institute of Health Policy Studies and Global Health Sciences, and uh, happy to introduce our speaker today, John Rose, who is an expert on the sweet choice experiments, including in health, um, and is head of the Institute for Choice I. Or C, do I have that right? University of South Australia. And going with the you know latest trends and in incorporating numbers into our acronyms. Very well done. Um, and he's going to talk with us today to give us an overview of the street choice and health, and also um, answer questions. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see we have a bunch of people interested in hearing about this very interesting area. Um, because we're a small group, and so John knows who we are. Uh, let's go quickly around the room and. Um, and tell him who we are. I, I do cost effectiveness analyses mostly and uh, a little bit in behavioral economics. Hi, I'm Nancy Beam. I'm a doctoral school a doctorate student in the School of Nursing. And, and my area of interest is minimum wage practices and delivery and support. And I want to thank Nancy for suggesting this seminar. Yeah, I discovered John my research and thought he was the answer to a lot of my questions. I was very excited when I learned this. My name is Wei Chang. I'm a research assistant here. I mainly work with Jim and Elliot on a campaign of effectiveness study for HIV and now TB. Uh, my name is Michelle Kong. I'm a postdoc at the Institute for Health Policy Studies and I'm today's facilities. I'm Elliot Marseille. I focus on cost effectiveness in global health, mainly HIV, but other disease areas too. Uh, I have been associated with UCSF for many years. For the past seven years or so, I've been consulting independently. I work closely with Jim and with Wei. I'm Phil from New Zealand, and um, this visiting at Stone Johnson's Tobacco Research Center over the financial side campus. And I've been involved in tobacco control research, kind of looking at um, market baskets, gun packaging, and so on. And I've worked with um, Jordan Bervia, who was in the Center for Choice, with um, John, John Pat Design, that called Sony Choice, which has just probably uh, it's not been a life while, but it was kind of a hard problem came out today. So I'm interested to hear him. I've heard him speak before, but I'm interested to hear what else he's got to say. And I'm Bronwyn Fields, and I am also So this is sort of like a high-level overview of the field. And uh, if you have any questions during the presentation or afterwards, please feel free to ask. Stop me. I have no ego when it comes to this type of thing. If you need more details about a particular thing, I'm more than happy to answer. Uh, the second thing I will say is uh, I apologize about the accent. Um, if you do, I do get, tend to get very excited, and uh, if you know anything about Australians, when we get excited, we talk really fast, and you're not going to understand a word I'm saying. So <laughs> if that happens, please just pull me up. I won't get upset. Um, so just a brief overview of what I want to do today, which is, first of all, uh, for some of you, you may have some familiar, 
familiarity with uh, choice experiments. I'm just going to present a very brief high level overview of what the methods are and what the assumptions are and what it all implies. Uh, I'm going to talk about different data types. So I'm always introduced as the discrete choice experiment guy. Um, my background is econometrics and economics and as an economist I hate hypothetical uh, choice experiments. I just tend to be good at the math that does that. So I, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about revealed preference as well because there's no difference in terms of the modeling whether it's revealed or pre uh, state of preference. It's still the same econometric models that we're estimating. So I don't want to be known just as the DCE guy. It's just the type of data I tend to deal with. Uh, I'm going to go through three case studies of uh, applications that I've been involved in with health. Um, I'm not a health economist. Uh, my formal training is econometrics and uh, I ended up more in the transportation field, but uh, experiments and DCEs are used in lots of different areas. So I publish in environmental economics, health economics, uh, transport, marketing, etc. So these methods can be used across a whole range of different things. So I'll talk about some of the stuff that I've been done, uh, doing in the health sphere. And then I'll have some conclusions and where I see the literature is actually heading. Uh, particularly in the health sphere, and uh, some limitations on these methods so they're not the answer to everything. So again, at a very high level, um, choice modeling, what is it? So I, I presume you're all familiar more with the linear regression type models. Um, and basically the assumption of the linear regression type models is that the dependent variable is a continuous variable. Um, the difference between that and choice modeling is that what we're really dealing with is discrete dependent variable, limited dependent variable type problems. So, um, and again, forgive me because I am not a health economist, so I had to try and come up desperately with a health economics example. Normally I'm used to dealing with cars, buses, and trains. Uh, but basically what we need to understand is that the way these experiments, the way that choice modeling is done, whether it's revealed preference or stated preference, is that we have a set of alternatives which are described by a set of attributes and attribute levels. And the difference between revealed preference and stated preference data is in stated preference data, we tell the respondent what the alternatives and the attribute levels are. And in revealed preference, they tell us what the attributes or alternatives were in the market that they faced. So that's the real difference. Um, we basically are making a number of assumptions. So uh, there are a whole range of new models and a whole range of new theories that are uh, starting to slowly creep into it. But the main assumption is that we assume people are utility maximizers. That is, they're maximizing their preferences for the set of alternatives that are shown. And in doing that, very clear distinction and a very clear assumption that people are trading off the attributes and the attribute levels of the alternative show. So in this case, people are able to trade off the duration with the cost. And in stated preference experiments, what we typically do in, in discrete choice experiments is we create these hypothetical markets and we vary the attribute levels. And in some cases, we can vary the alternatives as well uh, that they're shown. And by observing how people change their choices as we vary those attributes, we're able to infer i.e. via the model what their people's preferences are for each of those attributes. So that's the modeling part of it. Quick question, um, if you're going to get to this, uh, is it typical to just have a couple of attributes or more or longer strings? So, the important part, <laughs> and this is sort of the discussion we were having before um, before we came here, is what you need to be doing is actually spending quite a lot of time up front. In fact, about 60% of the time is the unfun time doing this, which is actually defining what the attributes, attribute levels and the alternatives are. Because what you really need to be doing is you need to be trying to get the true decision calculus that people would be doing if this was a real market. So if you're using a hypothetical market, we can just use you know, time and cost, for example. But if that's not the true preference trade-offs, 
people will do the experiment, but the marginal rates of substitution you get won't reflect the real markets. So um, we can have quite large choice tasks, uh, and some of these I'm going to show you are actually much more complex than what most people assume. I'll show you some case studies. Most people assume people can only handle seven plus or minus so many chunks of information. That's fine, uh, but there's a whole different literature out there that people may process this differently, and you can incorporate that in the model. People may actually, some people may be uh, more cost sensitive, some people more duration, some people, and we can actually model that also with, uh, with the preferences as well. So there's whole chunks of, of new models and, and techniques that are actually appearing within the literature. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So why do we do this? Um, we do choice modeling because it's fun. Well, I do choice modeling because it's fun. Um, but more importantly, it actually does provide us with a number of key outputs that are of interest uh, in terms of the economic um, interpretations that they give. At its basic level, uh, it helps us understand people's preferences for the various alternatives. And those preferences are defined in terms of socio-demographics, but also the attributes and the levels that we're varying in the experiment. And that gets to the point that was made before. If you don't put the attribute in, then you can't see how that actually influences preferences. So you want to actually define as much as possible, otherwise it's an emitted variable and it ends up in the error term. Um, so the primary reason we do it is to understand agent's preferences. Now, I'm using the word agent because it doesn't necessarily have to be um, patients or consumers. It can be organizations. It can be um, firms. It can be doctors. It can be nurses, pharmacists, etc. So we need to broaden the, the understanding of, of who we're modeling the preferences for. The outcome of these models are choice probabilities, so what's the probability of choosing each alternative, and you can aggregate that up over your sample is actually your market share prediction. So I'm going to show you examples where we predict, and I'll show you a, a decision support system later, where we're actually predicting the uptake of a new product in the health in the healthcare sector. So we're interested, sorry. We're interested in the demand uh, forecasting. Uh, what happens if a new product or you change a level of price changes, what will happen to the, the demand? Of more interest to me, typically, is uh, the marginal rates of substitution, which is how much people are willing to trade off one attribute with another in order to have the same level of preference, the same level of utility. If one of those trading off variables is cost, it actually converts it into a monetary value. You can add the trade-offs into a monetary value if you have a cost. So we have two different types of costs that we deal with. Uh, one's called, they typically call it willingness to pay. It should actually be marginal willingness to pay, which is how much you're willing to trade off a specific attribute or cost. So in uh, transport, the one that we typically deal with is time. How much are you willing to pay to save a minute of time? and still have no difference in your utility before or after that change. The one I'm going to actually be talking about a little bit later today is actually consumer surplus. And consumer surplus uh, has a number of different interpretations within the literature. It can be uh, interpreted as the dollar value of a new alternative entering into the market. So it's not necessarily the dollar value of a new attribute. But say we have a new drug coming onto the market, what is the additional benefits to society or to the consumers within that marketplace of having that new alternative into the market over the existing current marketplace? And these directly come out. All these directly come out of the model. Um, and the last one is elasticities and marginal effects. So uh, from an economic perspective, you know, what's the percentage change percentage change of, of, of price for some, some attribute. Uh, marginal effects are similar to elasticities, but therefore for qualitative attributes. So you can only have a um, percentage change for a quantitative variable. So how much does demand change if I change time? 
um, or price versus how much does demand change if I'm looking at male versus female. I can't take a 1% change in male or 1% change in female. Um, people tend to get very annoyed if you try and change their genders by a couple of percentage points. So these are all key outputs and they come out of the econometric models with uh, very with virtually no extra additional need. Uh, most software packages will just deal with this or you can work it directly from the model. Okay, so um, they're what you get from the models, but the types of data that we deal with are typically very different. Now, as I said, I'm always introduced as the state of preference DCE guy. Um, as an economist, I don't really like that because most economists don't like hypothetical markets, but um, I'll deal with that. Um, the two types of data that we typically deal with are revealed preference data and state of preference data. Uh, revealed preference data are uh, actually observed choices in real markets. So um, you observe that somebody has, has done X, Y, or Z in a real market. <coughs> Hypothet uh, state of preference data are hypothetical data in which creating these hypothetical scenarios, these hypothetical markets, and trying to get people to trade in those hypothetical markets. Um, the difference is, is that RP data is on the technological frontier. It's whatever is on the market. So if I was to look at the automobile market or the, the transport market, I can model what cars are currently on the market, what buses are on the market, what trains are on the market, but it's very unlikely that there are people riding horses around San Francisco. So it's not necessarily that the technological frontier is that way, but it can also be that way as well. State of preference data, because we're creating these hypothetical markets, you can vary the technological frontier in any direction you want. You can create new alternatives that don't exist. You can create new attributes that don't exist and see what would be the case provided that that happened in a real market. That's for another question, John. Yeah. Uh, uh, what evidence is there that revealed and stated preferences are the same for precisely the same? So there's been a lot of research um, being done on that. Typically, they're not used for the same types of problems. Typically, you would use state of preference for markets that are not traded. So um, in environments, you typically don't have a market for environmental goods. So if you want to value a river or a lake, um, you can't use revealed preference because people aren't typically paying to use that river or lake. Um, where they have been externally validated, uh, they are producing the same results up to some scale. So uh, what that basically says is if you were to estimate an SP and an RP model, then you could get you get the same results, but you have to scale one or the other to reproduce the other. They're, they're the same in terms of the ordering, but not the magnitude. From my little bit of knowledge, I don't know um, willingness to pay, though, uh, often is over overestimates what people are actually willing to, willing to pay. So it's better to use it more just sort of as a guide in, in terms of priority. Yeah. In, in the willingness to pay, so there's a couple of papers, um, particularly in transport, that have shown that there is an overestimation. Um, and so that's what I'm saying. It's up to scale. So if you have lots of attributes, they will tend to overestimate that you can scale them down what the RP, the, the order, ordering is the same, it's the magnitudes that are different. And I'll talk about some of the methods that are coming out of the environmental economics that try and reduce that bias. And it helps for willingness to pay. I mean, one of the things that the DSS don't take into account is the, the context of what's happening and the changes over time. And since we know poor people have more shocks to the system and things change day to day, we see we, the way that they would answer at one point could drastically change from the way they would answer at another point. And so again, just to bolster the idea that directionally it's correct, but I would never take the output of the model as the number that would be the right thing to do. Um, so review of preference, I mean, it's basically, as I said, trying to get information 
from real markets, actually observing what people do, uh, and that can be done in a number of different ways. So you can actually get scanner panel data um, and look at what choices have been made in, in a supermarket or a pharmacy, for example. Uh, primarily, however, we still rely on surveys. So primarily, we would typically ask the respondent in the survey, what did you do the last time you went to the pharmacy? What did you buy? Um, or what happened in this particular context? Um, depending on the availability of the data, so in Australia, there's a marketing research firm that collects all the scripts that doctors write. Um, and if you can actually somehow link that to the patients, you can actually build up quite good up data. Um, but I'm not going to concentrate on RP data. I like RP data. I just don't have access to very good RP data typically. Um, the steps in this are, and I've left off all the steps before, which are the steps before are the typical steps that you would do for any survey. Um, which is before you write the survey, identify the problem, do all your qualitative research, pilot, pilot again, pilot again, do more qualitative research, pilot again, and then get to your main field phase. Um, so we have the surveys themselves, we give the surveys to the respondents. This is the one that I did want to actually point out. And it may or may not be a problem for you, but it's a particular problem for a lot of us, for example, in transport which is when we actually observe people acting in a market, you observe what they did. But in order to model a choice, you need to know what they didn't do. Because it's the trade-offs between what they did and didn't do. And so in, if you have a survey where you ask, well, what did you do in this particular context? And you didn't ask, well, what didn't you do? So what was the price for the goods that you didn't pay for? Then how do you know why was it more expensive, was it less expensive? So um, either in some way, shape, or form, with revealed preference data, you need not just the data on the chosen, but you need the data on the non-chosen. And that may or may not be a problem depending on what you do. And that in itself, um, I think, when people always say that revealed preference is the gold standard, I have a paper where we do different ways where we infer in a transport context, the non-chosen, and we can manipulate the results of reveal preference. So um, it's not so whether SP is as bad as people say, because I can actually make RP just as worse. <laughs> Somehow we get this data. It's never spoken about. It just magically appears. So that's just there. Uh, we get the data. We estimate and we get the results. And I'll, I'll talk about some of those, not in an RP setting. The difference with that in SP is that in RP data, you can only model what's in the market at the moment. People can't choose alternatives that don't exist. So uh, in transport, that's a big problem because uh, we're talking about multi-billion dollar infrastructure projects building a new rail line. Um, and the only way you can get RP data on that is to build the rail line, see what happens, build a time machine, go back and report what happened so that you could say don't build it because nobody used it. So we use state of preference data when we have new alternatives on the market. Um, or when there are attributes that currently aren't existing in the real market, you can do that. Or levels. So the first thing that you learn in econometrics is you have a um, forecast within the range of data. So if the price range in your revealed preference uh, data is between this dollar amount and this dollar amount, really you shouldn't be forecasting what happens if the prices are going to continue further on into the future. And so it's not just the attributes and the alternatives, but you can stretch the levels of the data to try and forecast also into the future. And more importantly, um, and again this is more an environmental economics type problem, um, what happens if you're trade or you're looking at a good that's not traded in a private market? So how do we put a value on the BP oil spill? How do we put a value on the Exxon Valdez uh, disaster? How do we put a value on a river? So um, in that type of, of problem, because there's no real preference data on, on that, we have to rely on these types of methods. Um, it's slightly different in that we no longer have to infer 
the non-chosens because we create an experimental design. Now that's actually my research area of interest, is the experimental design. Um, from a theoretical perspective, it's actually probably the easiest part of the entire process. From those who are trying to enter the field, it's a, it looks like a lot of math. Um, and can I be brutally honest? We like to throw a lot of math to confuse people, but this is the thing I would be worried least about out of all this. But we design the hypothetical markets, and we do an experimental design. It's actually, as I said, theoretically quite easy. Put it into practice, it's quite complex, and it's quite contentious. Um, very, very contentious as to what type of design you should use and under what circumstance. But everything else is the same. The respondents, the data, the estimation. Only we've now created the hypothetical markets. I mean, I'm thinking of all the lessons from you know, behavioral economics where we know that if you ask people questions in a different order, you get different answers, or if you show them your, your drug pricing the example you had, and first you show them a study saying generic and you know, brand name drugs are different. How do you incorporate that? That is still being all debated. Uh, I just went to a conference last week where we were still arguing about all those effects, and we're finding all those effects. Um, it is, and um, that's why I keep on doing it. But I don't think there is any one answer. I think it's in, it's an empirical problem, which is why I hate. I said at the beginning, I hate dealing with people. The math is simple. <laughs> <laughs> but you could you could design you know, your experimental design to just include a couple of different alternatives that you look at the impact of whatever. Yeah, my 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 interest in experimental design is more on statistical efficiency and optimality criteria for the models we're estimating. Um, that way I don't have to think about how the people may be behaviorally interacting with it. <laughs> um, but it's an open question and it's one that's debated and has been debated for the last 80 years. Um, state of preference, I've used the term. State of preference is actually a broad choice. I don't actually know what state of preference is because it's not just one thing, it's multiple things. Um, and we tend to use it interchangeably when I don't think we should be. Um, state of preference is where you state a preference in some hypothetical market, but there are lots of different ways you can do it. Contingent valuation is uh, a method used mainly in environmental economics where you just ask a person, how much would you be willing to pay to save rainforest X? And there are different ways you can do it. There's bounded and unbounded um, contingent valuation methods. Traditional conjoint tasks is where you show people all enumerations of alternatives and they rate or rank. Um, you have stated choice, discrete choice experiments, choice-based conjoint, pairwise comparison. All different literature you use, all different names, it's all the same thing. Um, where basically you show people one or like two or three alternatives and you have them choose and then you show them another two or three alternatives and you have them choose another two or three alternatives and you have them choose. Um, and then there's best, worst or rankings where it's similar to state of choice or discrete choice experiments or choice based conjoint or pairwise comparison, whatever you want to call it, but you have them actually rank. You show them three and they rank in some way those three and then they're shown another three and they rank. So the difference between traditional conjoint and this is here they rank all in one go, and here they rank subsets repeatedly. So, and the discrete choice and the, the best worst ranking, those, those are I mean organized that way in order to get to, to um, address this issue of people responding differently depending on the presentation. So. Typically, these are used to um, explode the data because if you only get one year of three alternatives, what you prefer, you get incomplete preference rankings. So these are just designed to get complete preference rankings so that you can actually get more bang for your buck. That's that's how it's been created. Um, I think that's a little bit more complex in that you actually need to manipulate this, how the survey is done um, to actually see how it's done. This is just to try and get more more complete preference rankings. So I just want to go briefly over three different case studies so you can see how I've used it in health and I've done a lot of others. Um, the first two are for uh, 
consulting projects. Uh, I, Dinud is the first one, so that you don't know which company is, but you guys being in health, you could probably work it out. Um, the second one was a for a government submission, um, and I'll explain that. And the third one was for a, a grant looking at increasing and improving organ donations. So uh, the first case study that I want to talk about is in Australia, we have what's called the PBS, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. Uh, and I don't know how familiar you are with this scheme, but basically the government subsidizes certain drugs to the consumer, and there are two different types of subsidies, there's like general and then there's concession. So a concession would be for pensioners or the unemployed, for example. Um, general is for everybody. If a drug is not PBS listed, then the company can charge whatever they want and the consumer has to pay. If you're in the general part of the PBS, then it might be $30 and the government subsidizes the difference and the same for the concession. The concession I think is about 7 or $8 per time you fill it out. Um, so Pharmaceutical companies have to actually go through a rigorous process where they show that the drug does X, Y, and Z, um, but they also have to show the economic benefits of should the government subsidize that drug or not. So this was a study from a pharmaceutical company um, where they wanted to show the economic benefits and how much people were willing to pay. Um, in, in effect, they really wanted to consume surplus. What are the benefits of society if this drug was actually released onto the market. Um, and uh, it's a, it wasn't a new drug per se, it was a new delivery mechanism for um, patients suffering cystic fibrosis and a whole bunch of other long words that I have no idea what they mean. Um, and basically the current mechanism, those suffering from it had to have twice daily administration um, and each administration of this particular drug took about 20 minutes, but that was also not including the time that had to prepare um, the nebulizer and everything else. So this actually took quite a bit of time for people and carers as well to actually be able to use and implement this. Um, this particular pharmaceutical company um, created a new method to deliver this where it would take about uh, seven to ten minutes to actually deliver uh, whatever the drug was. and um, it didn't have to be cleaned, it didn't have to be done, um, and it was also portable. So this isn't portable. People have to actually have whatever the nebulizer is located in their house. This you could actually put in your car and go off, etc. cetera. So um, it's a new, a new alternative on the market. It hasn't been released to the market, so there's no revealed preference, so we had to do state of preference. Um, and so they were interested in looking at the consumer surplus, the economic benefits as the submission as to whether this should be PBS uh, pharmaceutical benefit scheme listed or not. So they contacted me. I did a state preference experiment for them. Um, so it's a powder versus a liquid inhalation type mechanism. I think the current was the and this was a powder form. They came up with the attributes. I didn't come up with the attributes. I'm not a health economist. And as I said, they use words I don't understand. Um, they came up with the levels. This is a best worst experiment where I asked them to tell me what the best alternative was and then I asked them what the worst is. So I actually get full rankings because there's two alternatives plus none. So there are three alternatives. By knowing the best and knowing the worst, I also know the middle one. So I actually get full ranking of the preferences in this particular task. Um, respondents completed eight of these tasks where we varied the levels of the alternatives. And um, we did not just patients, but we also did carers. So we did both patient and carers in this, this study. Um, I'm going to briefly brush over this, but these were the models that we estimated, um, where these are the attributes. So we had out-of-pocket costs. The, this drugs uh, tend to affect the voice, like give people hoarse voice, um, creates cough time to administer. All the parameters were in the right direction, so um, negative, you would expect that as the cost goes up, preferences go down. 
um, as the probability of having a bad voice goes up, your preference goes down, same with coughing, and same with time. This is an interesting model in that in this model, I actually was able to um, model different ways that people were processing this information. So 41% of the respondents were actually didn't care about the time or the cost or the, any of these things. So down here is the probability of them actually doing a particular type of processing that information. 41% just wanted a drug that would help them. So these are consonants, one with liquid, one with powder. They preferred the powder, the new one, to the liquid, but they preferred both to none. So they were just happy to have something that would help them with their, their problem. Um, interestingly, only 4% of respondents actually... 14% uh, actually didn't care about the time. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure I'm clear on this point. You're saying 41% of respondents only value getting the benefit of a drug, and they literally attach no value to those other attributes? From this data? That's surprising. Yep. Okay. So that's, that was the result. But yeah, now you've got it 100%. So this is what I'm saying when we can actually now jointly model not just their preferences, but how they're arriving at those preferences. And I was surprised that the whole 41%, they would just be happy to choose a drug, irrespective of time, cost, or anything like that. 26% um, actually, so you can see a large number of respondents didn't care about the cost at all. They just, they cared about other things. And we can actually yeah, the cost was capped at whatever it was in the experiment. I don't know what it was, but right. So but they were facing a maximum cost of yeah, two dollars for the subsidized for the fusion people or whatever that was. And then yeah, and and it went beyond what the the cap was. So because it's an SP experiment, we went beyond the range. But whatever the range was, up to that point, they didn't care. They didn't care. That's what the the data said. That totally makes sense if you know anybody who has yeah. Can you go back one to the to the well, back one slide, Elliot? Yeah. Can you? Elliot, I'm not on one. So I can't be this here. But did, in order to figure out what people cared about, uh, did you vary the attributes yes. and repeatedly ask them to choose? Yes. How many times did this? Hey. Thank you. Got it. Um, and. There are a whole bunch of other questions in the survey, but this, this was the part that I'm reporting. So, um, next slide. So this is what we presented to the client and to the government. It's a decision support system, um, a dashboard, etc. And I've denuded it. The client was there, and there were pretty pictures of what the real products were, and, and etc. But what this allows you to do is sitting behind this is the models that I just showed. We have um, Models for patients, models for the carers, and then a combined model where I've, I've pulled both the data sets. Um, these are the willingness to pay that the respondents that came out of the model. So the uh, patient for the liquid inhalation was happy to pay two dollars ninety-two to have uh, for every additional minute saved to administer, uh, but for the existing powder it was only twenty-four cents. So there was a price differential that they're willing to pay for the new the new mechanism. Um, and the carers, you can see also that they were willing to pay more for each of the attributes than uh, for the existing method. The consumer surplus estimates are down here. This is per patient. Um, relative to not having any anything for uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, the benefit to each patient per month is $134 for having the powder and $200 for having the new method. So there's a 70 odd or 65 dollar odd difference in terms of the benefits that they gain from moving to the new delivery mechanism. Um, Do you have a general threshold for when you decide perhaps you actually have the wrong attributes to begin with? 
Um, unfortunately, in this case, I was sub, I was the sub, 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 sub consultant to a right. sub, 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 sub consultant. So they defined right. all that. Right. Um, and yeah, look, if I had my time again and I was right. in charge, I wouldn't have. Right. Obviously, That's the qualitative that research that had, had not come yeah, out well. Again, I don't like kneeling with people, so I just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> estimating the model. So this is this is the decision support system, and what it allows you to do is to change the level. So at the moment, this is 26 minutes, and that's eight minutes. You can change these, um, and you can put in other numbers. So you can increase or decrease that, and it'll change the market share analysis. It'll change the. It feeds through all the model. All the models are sitting back there. You can see how the demand. Predictions change. You can see how the, the consumer surplus, etc., changes. So um, these are all the outputs of the models, just presented in a, a different way than what we would typically do in a academic type setting. Um, that all makes sense. And you can see you can play around and feed through all these and, and do whatever you want. This I think is this is so cool. I, I, I've done a bunch of this stuff in, in market research, so from the company side. And having this tool where you can be like, okay, well, let's let's just assume the price is this. And what happens? And like instantly you get to see at least a version of what is likely to happen. It's a pretty easy tool. Oh, it's and this is a very basic one. We now move leaps and bounds beyond this. Um, this was from 2012. So um, I now have a one of my former PhD students is specialised just in presenting dashboards, and he makes this look like a I don't know, that's model T four. <laughs> um, okay, if we go back to the presentation. So I just wanted to show you some of the stuff and how it can be used and the types of things. And I think that that, that that type of output, as you said, to me it's a really cool way, not from an academic perspective, but what I would actually like to do is put these type of stuff, take the models from an academic perspective and put these on my website so people can play around with it and see what it really means in real life. Um, the second study was also for government submission, um, which is looking at market structure preferences. So um, basically what happened, if you, next slide please, is uh, in 2014, the Australian government had a inquiry, we love having inquiries, um, into uh, competition policy. And it was all across all sectors. And part of the, what they looked at uh, was the pharmaceutical or the pharmacy sector. Um, and in Australia, the pharmacy sector, to own a pharmacy, it's heavily, heavily, heavily regulated. So only a pharmacist can own and operate a pharmacy. So you can't be a billionaire and own pharmacies unless you are a pharmacist yourself. Um, there are restrictions on where the pharmacies can be located. Um, supermarkets can't sell drugs, etc., um, because otherwise they'd have to have a pharmacist there, etc. And you know, you can only have so many pharmacists. Like they have to be a kilometre apart. You can't have two pharmacists next to each other unless they were there back in 1950. Um, so there's all these restrictions. And so uh, this report looked at um, looked at should the pharmaceutical or the pharmacy pharmacy the pharmacy market be deregulated. Um, we were employed as an institution what people's preferences are for different market structures in the pharmacy market. So what we did is we did a state preference experiment because the unfortunately the market is the market. There's no revealed preference market as to what would happen if it's deregulated. So we only have this. We don't have the counterfactual case in review of preference. So we, we created a state of preference experiment. And this is what I'm saying. Everybody thinks you have to have very simple experiments. It's not necessarily true. If people are interested in the study, they will do it. Um, here we actually had respondents answer six of these questions where we presented them a hypothetical market. Now, this was all explained to them, so they weren't just thrown in the deep end where we varied the number of pharmacies. This is distance from the house. Um, we also had distance from work, et cetera. And we varied uh, where they were located. So you could click on 
these, all these pluses you could click on and it would pop up and it would say, you know, um, this one is located within a supermarket, this one's located in a supermarket, etc. So all these had different rooms. This one was just located in a normal street as they currently are. And then we described each of these in more detail. Um, so this is Pharmacy 1. It's located in a shopping centre and there's a medical centre there. Um, this one's just located in a shopping centre. Uh, how long it takes to get home. As I said, you could also scroll on and there would be pop-ups in this. Uh, and then we asked them what they preferred in terms of which, super, which, which pharmacy would they be more likely to go to. Um, what the client was interested in is this trust, how much they trust the client. We struggled with how to represent that. Um, this was the best we could come up with. I'm sure there's better ways, but it's like three days to do this study. So um, as clients often do, if you work for a marketing research firm, you know what I mean. So um, I'm not going to get bogged down with the results. We estimated lots and lots of different models. Um, we estimated, in this case, what's called a latent class model, which is basically it's a less restrictive model in that it can find latent segments within your model. And this is just one segment. So 67% of the respondents in this particular um, data set, this represents their preferences. So there was another class that represented the other 33% of respondents. They had different preference structures than this one. Um, and so you could see, for example, in this particular case, costs was negative for the street, but people didn't care about, uh, sorry, the distance. They didn't care about the distance to supermarket or shopping centers, because probably they were going there for other reasons. So having a supermarket there was just an additional benefit in this particular segment. The cost was all negative, so as cost goes up, preference go down, and the willingness to pay is we're actually about a dollar. So it didn't really matter. The willingness to pay is, uh, didn't change. Um, waiting time for scripts, they didn't mind, so they didn't mind if it's at a supermarket, because you could probably wander off and do other things. Um, if it's just at a shopping centre, then there was some negativity, but it was less than if it's on the street. And you can go through but Basically, all the signs, everything made sense. Yep. You said six scenarios, and what was the end? How many people did you run through? Uh, I think it was the, this one. Uh, and it was broken up by a segment. So it's, uh, again, some people were concession, and some people were non-concession. Mm -hmm. um, so you had to have lots of different quotas and lots of different segments. This is just one. But there was a, over a thousand. And again, this is the output. I don't have this one here, unfortunately, but this was the submission. And so again, you could change the levels and see what it would do to consumer surplus or demand, etc., for these different alternatives. Um, since we've done this, uh, the government has signed off on the agreement with the Pharmacy Guild, and they've given them another $1.9 billion uh, per year over the next five years. I'm not getting anywhere near that. Um, <laughs> so I'm a little bit upset about that. You need to maintain the status quo. Yes. So they're not going to deregulate it. Um, so we were we were paid by the pharmacy guild. I'm not going to go into my, which side I'm on morally. I'll go into which side I was on um, for this project. And they basically um, decided on this and other other work to stick with the, the regulated market and give them more money. <laughs> you should have worked on commission. Yeah. <laughs> you should have. Um, the third um, project, I think maybe a little bit more interesting for you guys, is uh, part of the Australian Research Council grant um, looking at organ donations. And it has a cast of a thousand. Um, I don't know who 90% of these people are. Some of them are nephrologists or something, I have no idea what that is. Um, so that might mean something to you, it means nothing to me. Kidneys. Okay, I don't know what this thing here is, um, I just found a picture. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not a medical, I have nothing, no interest in medicine. Um, if it's, I don't care. Um, so this was part of a, a grant uh, awarded by the Australian um, Australian government, federal government, uh, 
to look at improvements of uh, of organ donation. And um, there were several studies. This is just one of about a million things that we did. Uh, but the, the problem is, is that uh, we have really, really low organ donation rates in Australia. And if you look at the data, um, we could only find this really in Australia. About 20 people in the US die per day on waiting lists for organ donation. Um, and it's probably a lot worse uh, in Australia because we really, really need to do something. Um, yet all the surveys, and not just our surveys, but all the surveys in Australia show that between 70 and 80 percent of people support organ donation. It just doesn't translate through to the reality. Um, and the actual organ donation, we only have less than 23 percent are actually If you go to the next slide, I'll show you. The reality, it's much less than 23%. It's actually 15.1% um, of respondents, uh, of people are actually organ donors. Um, and there's reasons for this, historical reasons. Uh, most people in Australia actually think they're organ donors, but they're not. <laughs> um, so a long, long time ago, uh, when you got a driver's license, you could tick a box that says, I want to be an organ donor, and everybody does that, and it makes them feel good. Uh, that means uh, absolutely nothing, though. Um, in the old system, it did. They still, in certain states, my state, I have it on my driver's license, uh, but that's been decoupled from the actual organ donation. So, as I said, most people think by ticking that box, but that's not the process to actually become an organ donor. Um, it's a different system. It's an opt-in system. Spain is, I believe, an opt-out system, so they have much higher. You know more about this than me, um, but we really need to do something. Um, it's not the in-system, active donor registration, um, and even if you are an organ donor, your family can overwrite you. If you're dead, your family can say, no, sorry, we reject it anyway. Um, so it's much worse than what I portrayed. Um, and so it's really, really confusing. And we have a state-based system, not a federal system. The register is, I think, Australia and New Zealand. Um, but every state has different rules and regulations how they do this. And as I said, um, nobody knows. And if you went and picked the average Australian, couldn't tell you. I, until I worked on this project, I thought I was an organ donor. I'm not. Um, and there's no financial mechanisms in place. So we did a whole bunch of research. We got uh, qualitative research, focus groups, in-depth interviews. Um, it was a PhD student. She went all over Australia. Uh, looked primarily also a lot at indigenous populations um, and, and whatnot. Um, did a lot, a lot of focus groups and 114 participants, which is quite a lot. And we basically found out what the attributes actually drive people's choices in um, organ donation. So these were the attributes that came out of the qualitative research, things like, um, and this is only one part of the study. This was looking at people's preferences for donating, who they would donate organs to. So what, rather than having, uh, I think the current mechanism is it looks at, you know, what's the survival, what's going to have the greatest survival rate. Um, of, this, of the graph or whatever. I hope that's correct. Um, but what is the community's preferences for, would they rather give it to a young child, an old person, a smoker, a non-smoker, etc.? So this is trying to bring community preferences into it. Um, so age, gender, um, whether they've had a previous um, transplant, whether they're a donor or not, whether they have children, etc., and a whole bunch of other lifestyle, drinking, alcohol, etc. This is what came out of came out of the qualitative research. Uh, we have 2,051 respondents across Australia. It was an internet panel, so um, it's not mailing mail out. Uh, they were over 18 years of age. Uh, we generated design, not so much important, and then we've estimated the models. This is an example of the choice task. In the survey, so 
I don't know how many they did. It varied because we did 16 or 17 different studies looking at various aspects to this. Um, I think they did about 12 or so of these where we varied the characteristics of these patients, is patient A, patient B, which one would you most likely, if there was a kidney, which one would you prefer to give the kidney to? Interesting. You're, you're not looking at who actually is an organ, you know, prospective organ donor. You're just asking everybody what their thoughts are on organ donation. So it seems like the big issue here is that people don't know what they have to do. As I said, we've done lots and lots of different experiments. This is just one. So we've looked at from um, what would more likely make you an organ donor. Um, this you is just had, looking you at... You what you had to do. Yeah. yeah, so this is just what is the community preferences for organ donation. This is, again, just one of lots of different stuff. Um, apparently, health people like odds ratios. I prefer betas. So I've put these into the odds ratios. Um, but quite clearly you can see that there is what we would expect in terms of things like age. So um, the lower the age, the higher the odds that that will be the chosen recipient for an organ. So, you know, there is, people would prefer to give it to younger rather than um, older people. Um, if you've had a previous transplant, then they'd rather not give that to you. Um, for adherence, again, not male versus female, they didn't care, same once, so there's no gender um, bias. Uh, if you're registered, they'd rather give that to you. Uh, how long you've been on the waiting list, also, they'd rather give it to people who've been on it uh, longer, and waiting list, etc. It's, it's positive as well. So it's not just in terms of community preference, I'm not saying this is what you'd want to implement from it health system perspective, but the community preferences may not necessarily align for the current system in place. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'll leave it for others to, to interpret. Um, life expectancy and um, is statistically significant. So that, that sort of does align with the current system that you want the screen, you know, want the graph to actually take. Um, if they've, got, if they've got cancer or diabetes with cancer or hepatitis, then they'd rather not give it to you. But diabetes by itself, they, that wasn't a differentiator. Um, we hate smokers. <laughs> smokers do not get a um, transplant. Uh, and um, unfortunately for Australians, because everybody in Australia drinks, um, we're going to give it to foreigners because <laughs> we don't like drinkers getting transplants either. Um, and the obese also would prefer not to give it to them. So there are actually things like that. Um, and the quality of life also comes into it. If a person is going to have a higher quality of life with the transplant, we'd rather give it to them. Um, so, you know, younger, if they're under 40, um, we're happy to give them a transplant. If you're over 40, then bad luck. Just go away and die. Um, if you have kids, if you have dependents, we would much rather give a transplant the community to somebody who has dependents than somebody who isn't. And then all these other other stuff, um, not to smokers, not to drinkers, and not to uh, those who are obese as well. So these are the community preferences. Um, you know, so basically what we're saying is, is the current system only looks at what's if the community was to have its way, um, they would actually prefer to have other factors. In particular, we would much rather give it to people who have dependents um, or who have been on the waiting list longer. So some sort of fairer system um, from a societal perspective, maybe not from a medical perspective. Um, they also, you know, the donor status, we would much rather give something, give a transplant to somebody who's willing to give a transplant than to people who are not, which I think you pointed out is a bit problematic because everyone thinks they're a donor, but they're not. Um, and, you know, so preferences for people who've been on the waiting list. That's the community preferences. Whether the government does anything with this, I don't know, but that's what the community wants. Uh,
So there is a move towards these uh, allocation algorithms that, that just deal with one aspect, which is uh, higher life expectancy. Um, and this was, we, I think we only looked at kidneys in this particular study. Um, but what we're actually saying is that if the community was actually to have the biggest say in this, they would actually look at other factors as well, particularly quality of life, et cetera. Um, so community expectations don't necessarily align this, uh, in this case with the current practice. Now, again, I'm not going to get into whether the government should do anything about it. This was just an interesting study um, that we've, we've done. So conclusions, and then I'll shut up. Um, choice modeling is a broad church. Uh, it's, it's an applied economic field. So the problem that I have, and I think if you're thinking about entering into this market, is that you can't just read or rely on one discipline's knowledge. Um, every month I take two or three days where I read environmental economics, health economics, marketing, transportation, economics, econometrics, literature. Um, see what they're all doing because everybody's doing something different. And so uh, try and stay on top of the field itself is really, really challenging. Um, in health context, I've only just given you a few various things, but it's been used to, for example, they, uh, provide a value of life. Um, so rather than rely on a human capital approach, um, we've used state preference methods to actually put a, a dollar value on life. Um, we've done that in transport contexts to value um, road investments and safety features for road investments, etc. It's been used for quality of life, um, systems design. So a lot of what we do is actually in aged care and trying to divide, uh, design better aged care facilities that will meet um, the needs and wants of people who are about to enter into aged care facilities. Um, it can be used to understand barriers to adoption. So uh, the real question is, we're bombarded with all this knowledge about how we should eat healthily, yet we don't. So what's preventing that actual transition from the knowledge to the actual action? And so um, you can use these types of methods to try and understand what's really going on, what's preventing people from doing what they know they should be doing. Um, or, you know, for example, in Australia, another big problem we have is somebody wrote apparently that uh, vaccinations cause autism. That's been discredited 60 million times, and yet um, it's gaining more traction in Australia, and vaccination rates are dropping. And we now have measles, whooping cough, and a whole bunch of other stuff that 10 years ago didn't exist, and it's all come back again. The other thing is, is I've sort of presented only part of the literature. Um, there's a whole growing area of interest in group decision making or multiple agent decision making. A lot of decisions are not necessarily made by an individual in a household. So my area of interest is, uh, for example, automobile choice. And if I was to tell my partner what car we're buying, um, I probably wouldn't be here standing here today. Um, she tells me what car I'm buying. So it's not necessarily one agent in a cohort, and particularly in a medical uh, situation, it might be multiple agents making that decision. Um, so there is a lot of research that's been done in, in multiple agent group decision type making. And then there's a whole bunch of econometric models which have appeared over the last five years. Um, for example, the incorporation of attitudes into decision making. So here I'm varying the attributes, but attitudes might be important. And so we have these models for these, uh, where you have structural equation models estimating the attitudes, and they simultaneously feed into your uh, discrete choice models. And you can have a look at how they interact um, with the decision making. Uh, and the one that I'm quite excited about and starting to play around is, is with what we call multiple discrete continuous choices, which is a lot of choices aren't necessarily just discrete and a lot of choices aren't necessarily continuous, but they're both. So um, this has been used a lot in activity-based type modeling. So you choose to undertake an activity and then you choose how long you undertake that activity. And so there's a whole bunch of research that's been done in decisions that are both continuous and discrete at the same time. Um, but if you're not mathematically inclined, I would skip that for the moment until we've sorted through all the econometric. Even I really don't fully understand half these models that are coming out now. 
Uh, in terms of limitations, um, I'm going to be brutally honest. This is more art than science. Um, I've spoken to a few PhD candidates um, before I got here, and you know, as I've said, my area of expertise is experimental design. It's just presented as all Greek alphabet math, which doesn't necessarily have to be that. The empirical versus the theoretical, they often align, and so I think we need to get much better at actually aligning those two. Um, review preference data, we should be using more of it, uh, particularly in a lot of literature where we tend to rely on SP, but we need to understand that um, you can actually use both. It's not either or. And so we had the example, you know, what what happens if you have SP and convert it to RB? There's actually a whole modeling methods and techniques in literature on how you can combine and pull both data sources and get the richness of both. So rather than just treat it as an either or proposition, you can actually get the best of both worlds. Um, the problem is, though, that if you're new to this, you do have to understand the Greek alphabet up to a certain level. So there does need to be some training um, for certain things. Uh, if you're going to do SP, as some people are finding out, you know, it's not just taking a design from somewhere else and putting it in here. There is whole statistical realm uh, of things that you do need to consider when generating state preference experiments. And you do need, it's not just as simple as running regression models, you do need some understanding of your econometric methods because there are so many pitfalls and problems that people fall into. Um, so what I guess I'm saying is we really need to be training people much better than what we are at the moment. And there's very little opportunity for training at the moment. Um, there's a few courses scattered around the world, et cetera, but they're not coordinated. Um, so I'm asking for more training. And I think that's it. Thank you. I think we're really valuable about this just by the arts. Okay. But especially as we think about how that plays out some of the cost effective stuff, effectiveness stuff, it's pulling in this, even the SP, to how do we figure out what people would do rather than doing as much of it as there is, I think, would shorten our, our cycle. Okay. The cycle of ours, instead of doing the full RTG, yeah. it takes to an idea that Jessica Kosky mentioned at the, in a couple of contexts where uh, he's the dean of the School of Public Health and uh, an economist, health economist by train, where he says, we don't know anything in academics, the business community knows, and when, when Starbucks is putting out a new product, they don't do RTGs. And but they do. Yeah. That. Exactly. You know, exactly. My point that, that there's, there's this convergence of you know, looking for efficiency you know, to be continued when you're not running off. Um, I, I had a, a question. I saw a nice presentation by Margaret Crook many years ago, um, just uh, to speak choice experiment where she was trying to figure out what people in a rural, I think African community thought about of local health centers um, made them choose one center over the other. She did it all with visual, visually, with cards. How well does the visual approach work if you have non-literate populations? Oh, I just got the, I just have a PhD student who's just completed uh, doing something very, very similar in India. Um, in certain contexts, it works very well. In others, it makes no difference. Um, I think in, I think it's got to do with literacy level of where you're going. Um, if you're coming for a completely illiterate, then you have to have pictures. Um, the study that I've done is actually looking at uh, bushfire evacuations. So in Australia, I think, like in California, you have lots of bushfires. And so we did an SP experiment to try and figure out when people are likely to evacuate given a bushfire. And we had videos, we had pictures, and we just had standard text. We found no differences in the parameter estimates across the three. In other cases, though, I think it does make a big difference. So there's a classic case in London where uh, they were trying to look at differences between the tube and above ground uh, metro or railway. And 
they had an artist come in and draw pictures of the tube and it was all nice and clean, etc. And then they took a photo of an above ground station and, they used that. <laughs> and it was basically some Englishman standing there with an umbrella looking grumpy, etc. And that um, because people weren't choosing on the avenues, they just saw grey sky, rain, drizzle, etc. So I think it can, in certain contexts, um, induce differences, but it's an empirical question. I don't think there's a theoretical reason. But the studies that I've looked at in terms of um, in terms of literacy levels, it makes I think it is absolutely necessary. <laughs> Medicare's Part D, where he simulated what they what seniors would see on the actual website about your different plan options, and then simulating how well they're able to choose plans on their stated attributes, but you know, participating in what they chose, and then what would happen if you tweak the presentation like that? What they want to say? What they should best do? Uh, I mean, I've, I've done airline posts where I've actually created a website like Expedia or something like that compared it to a traditional SP, and there were differences. Um, I think it also makes a lot of sense when we're dealing with probability. Um, and there's a lot of work coming out of uh, the health economics area of rather than say 90% or you know 0.9 probability. You know, how can you represent that so that people can actually make sense of it? So you know, they have a hundred people. Ten of them are coloured red, and ninety of them are coloured green, and things like that. So there's a lot of work being done by Reed Johnson in health economics, looking at visualisation of probabilities and how people can process that much better. Um, I was wondering if you could go back. You talked about having a meeting with the and how do you interpret that? What, what does it mean when you have that? Now, in your example, I I expect. I didn't expect people to choose neither because this is like what you're talking about, it's like an age. But in my case, 80% of women give birth at home. So if I give them a choice of neither health facility, I'm afraid yeah. that they're going to pick neither because, in fact, it's not their preference. But what I want to know is what of these attributes that I'm giving them, you know, I'm trying to find out what's important. So. Um, this is actually a very, very um, interesting problem, and it's one I've encountered. So in Australia, we're the home of toll roads. So you can't walk outside without being tolled for going on a road. Um, in the UK, they have like one toll road, and I think it was Roman from 6,000 years ago or something like that. So we did a study in the UK where there's no experience of it, and our fear was 99% of people would always choose the non Toll road, stick with their current non toll road, the neither. Um, so, the point about SP and the great part of it is you create the question. So, um, the reason I did the best worst was that I had alternative A, alternative B, and none. And if I do the best worst, I actually get the full ranking. So, if they choose the none as the best and B as the worst, then I know that the preference is for none, then for A, and then for B. And so I can actually just model the conditional demand, which is what you're after, but I can also model the unconditional demand. So by getting the full preference rankings, you can model both. Um, and what we sometimes do is we ask, things going on here? is we ask multiple ask A, B, or none, and you say, which would you choose? And then you say, if you had to choose, which would you choose? And so right. you can model the conditional demand if you need that trade-off. If, if, if everybody's going to choose this, you can't really model anything because they're not trading off. Right. So this forces the trade-offs if you need it. Um, so, but you, you create the questions. It doesn't just have to be one question. What would you choose if you had to choose? What would you choose? There's some good evidence with the behavioral economics that having a third option can change your preferences among the other two options. So it's called the decoy effect, uh, right? Okay. So um, and it depends on it, it depends on dominancy, etc. As well. So um, if you add a, a new option, 
uh, depending on how close or far away it is from the other options, it can actually shift preferences quite significantly. So, so it's recommended to have that third option then? It depends if you're trying to induce that effect. Um, Typically, most choice experiments are A, B, and none. And then, as I said, if you if you fear that they're going to choose none most of the time, you can ask a second question if you had to choose which would be. Okay. So what what I have set up right now is I'm planning to ask people my set of questions, just which where would you prefer to deliver A, B, and none? But then I'm going to ask them the same set of questions. But in this case, I'm going to say um, you're fearful for the life of the mother and the baby. Now which would you choose? So I think that will That's the same thing. give me the same effect yeah. as your second. Yes. You know, um, yeah. I don't expect people to say no if they think someone's going to die. That, that's correct. And in the applied economic skills, this has been studied, um, particularly in marketing of all places. Um, this is called unconditional demand. So, And this is called conditional. Conditional on you having to choose, what is your preference? And so there's, we know that the two are not necessarily the same, but in the case where 80 or 90 percent choose this, you're not going to get a, a model because they're not trading off times and costs. Everything's going to be insignificant. So you need to then start looking at conditional demand, conditional on you being people for your child. What would you do? So there is a whole literature. I've got about 80 or 90 papers, or not 80 or 90. I've got about half a dozen papers I could send okay. you that, that look at that exact issue. Um, where, so we were talking about modeling earlier, but where do your demographics come into this? I mean, I'm, I'm setting up my experiments to compare male and female responses, but there's lots of other demographic issues that would be nice. So um, typically for project work, uh, the client has particular quotas that they're interested in, age quotas, gender quotas, uh, income quotas, etc. And it comes down to what you want to do with the data. So uh, at the end of the day, you can also weight your data. So um, for example, there's two types of weighting. You can weight what we call endogenously or exogenously. Endogenously is um, probably not of interest to you, but say I sample in revealed preference data so say I have, um, I'm interested in car, bus, and bicycle. Now, one person in a thousand in Sydney rides a bicycle. So I'm never going to actually get that. If I did a random sample, I'm unlikely to get that person. So you oversample certain choices. Um, that's called endogenous weighting. And so you, you need bicycle riders in the sample to be able to estimate bicycle parameters. Then you have to reweight the data reweight afterwards endogenously. So you're you're reweighting the choice because it's bicycle versus car or bus. Exogenous weighting is if you have oversampled say income levels, then you have some sort of census data and you know that you've got too higher income, you can reweight the data on that. So you need the sociodemographics to um, reweight the data. The other way that this can work is well, there's lots of ways it can work, is it could enter your utility function. So age or gender could be a factor in your utility. So um, for example, uh, transport examples, but um, females might might be less likely to choose a bus for safety reasons. So rather than just have um, times and costs in the utility, you can enter socio-demographics in the utility and see if they actually have an influence on the choices as well. Because this is just like a linear regression model. You can enter covariates into your linear regression model. And you can in choice models as well. Um, in the latent class model, remember how I, I had class two? You can actually try and see if socio-demographics or covariates are causing the different latent, uh, latent classes as well. There's lots of different ways you can enter, but it can be entered in, into your model. So um, just a practical matter, we, we want to take John to lunch, and we're going to go do that next. If anyone wants to join us, uh, we're going to find out what uh, John's 
uh, preferences are, say it or revealed, <laughs> regarding cuisine. Um, and then we're going to go uh, see if that really pans out when we check out a restaurant. Um, we'll probably, given the options around here, we'll probably uh, take a nice takeout place and sit in the courtyard. Um, and uh, so we should probably switch over to that. Again, if people want to join us, they're welcome to. Thanks again, John, for a great talk. Thank you.